Part 2. A Pitiful Life. As Zach moved with hurried steps, he thought about how pitiful his life had been. He had been born to a farmer's family in a village of the kingdom. It could not be considered a happy life by any stretch of the word. The fruits of their hard labor were taken away by the lord of the land. If he took 60% of their harvest, it might still be bearable. They could still live on the Rima in 40%, albeit in poverty. However, if he took 80% of their harvest, they would be in big trouble. It was hard enough to survive on 40% of the crops. If they only had 20% left, their lives would be extremely difficult. During that year when they had only been allowed to keep 20% of their harvest, Zach returned home, exhausted from a day of hard fieldwork, and found that his little sister was missing. At that time, Zach was young and did not know what was going on. His beloved little sister had disappeared, yet his parents had not gone looking for her. Zach understood now that she had probably been sold off. Slavery was now outlawed through the efforts of the Golden Princess, but at that time it had been quite widespread throughout the kingdom. Therefore, whenever Zack went whoring and passed a hooker, he could not help but look at the girl's face. Of course, he did not think he would actually be able to find his little sister, and even if he did find her, he did not know what he would say to her. Even so, he could not help but keep looking. And amidst this miserable life of poverty, he had been conscripted. The kingdom periodically mobilized its armies against the empire, and when it did so, the kingdom would round up all the able-bodied men in the villages and send them to the battlefield. The absence of their strong young men for a month had dire consequences for the villagers. However, some people were grateful for this conscription. After all, the less mouths to feed, the less food the families would need. In addition, the young conscripts would be fed by the kingdom. For some, it might be the first time they had ever eaten their fill. Still, that was all the mare that situation held. No matter how hard a man fought, he would not be rewarded unless he had made outstanding accomplishments. No, sometimes these men would not be rewarded no matter what they did. Only the lucky would be rewarded. Then, when they returned to their villages, they still had to face the despondent reality that the harvest was poor, because there had been too few hands to take it in. Zack had been conscripted twice, but his third tour of duty had seen his fortunes change. That war had been the same as all the others, ending after a few minor skirmishes. Zack, who had held on to his life, was about to head home when he stopped. He looked at the weapon in his hand, and it was as though he had received a sign from the heavens. Instead of returning to his village, would it not be better to choose a different way of life? Still, Zack was a mere farmer with just a bit of basic traring. He had little choice in what sort of new life he could lead. He did not possess exceptional physical abilities, nor did he possess a talent, a special ability that was only possessed by a few special people. His learning was largely related to farming when to sow which seeds and so on. What Zach decided to do pertained to the sole trump card he possessed. In other words, running away with the weapon that the kingdom had temporarily issued him. He had not considered the difficulties it would cause for his parents because they had sold off his little sister even if it was to keep the rest of the family alive and thus he did not love his parents. But how could someone who did not know the land or have any backers does it so easily? In the end, he managed to find people to help him, which was fortunate, in a sense. The people who aided him in deserting were a band of sellswords. Of course, a farmer like Zack was hardly of any use to a mercenary band. However, the band had lost many of its members during the war, and their aim was to replenish their numbers as soon as possible. This was the reason why the mercenary band let him join so easily. 
However, they were not a proper, law-abiding organization. While they fought as mercenaries in wartime, during peacetime they were essentially bandits. After that, Zack led a life filled with unspeakable deeds. Having was better than not having. Taking was better than being taken from. Making others weep was better than weeping himself. This was the life Zack lived. He did not feel it was wrong, nor did he regret it. His faith in that grew ever deeper every time he heard the wails of the oppressed. Zack ran through the pauper's district. He ran toward a world that was a deeper red than the setting sun. Having run continuously ever since leaving the inn, he was panting heavily and his forehead was covered in sweat. His building fatigue made him want to stop, and he wondered if he should take a break. However, time was tight, and so Zack spurred his tired body forward and continued running. Just then, as Zack took a sharp turn, that was close, mumbled the figure on the other side of the corner as it somersaulted away, accompanied by the clattering of metal. A startled Zack looked at the black shape which had leapt clear. She was a pretty girl. She wore a black cape which made her seem to blend into the shadows, but her shiny purple eyes, filled with curiosity, were looking straight at Zack. Tired and out of patience, Zack yelled at her. That's my line. It's dangerous. Watch where you're going. The girl did not seem afraid of Zack's ranting. Instead, she smiled coldly. That spine-chilling smile made Zack retreat instinctively, without the courage to so much as draw his weapon. It was like a lion glaring at a mouse. Perhaps the sound of metal he heard when the girl had leapt back came from the armor she was wearing. An armed and armored girl, perhaps she was an adventurer. He had picked the wrong person to antagonize. Danger sirens blared through Zack's head, and at the same time he thought of something. He did not look down on her as weak because she was a woman. Zack knew that there was an adventurer team composed purely of strong women. The strongest man in the mercenary band he belonged to had brought it up once. On the other hand, Zack might have been a mercenary, but he was one of the weakest members of their fighting men. This was why he had been given a job like this. He was covered in sweat from running, and as Zack began regretting what he had done, it quickly became another type of sweat altogether. Just as a look of fear completely covered Zack's face, the girl's smile lost its frightening quality. Him a well, forget it. I don't have time for this. Still, if I run into you again, you're going to have a bad time. The girl went around him, leaving those words behind. Interested, Zack turned to watch as she left. He mused that the place in front of him was an uninhabited part of the pauper's district. What was a beautiful woman doing out here so late? The thought piqued his curiosity, but he had something more important waiting for him, so he cut his introspection short and moved on. Soon, he arrived in the pauper's district, at a corner which was filled with many run-down houses. He looked around to see if anyone was following him. The sun slowly sank beneath the horizon, painting the world in shades of black, so Zack focused on whether anyone was hiding in dark corners. He had already checked several times before now, but just to be safe, he took one last look. Zack nodded in satisfaction, and as he got his breathing under control, he knocked thrice on a door. After waiting five seconds, he knocked four more times. After giving the prearranged signal, he received an immediate response. The creaking of wood came from the other side of the door, and the wooden shutter which blocked the peephole slid out of the way. Zack could see a man's eyes on the other side of the door, looking him up and down and verifying his identity. It's you. Eh? Wait a minute. Without waiting for Zack's reply, the man slid the peephole shut, and that sound was followed by that of a heavy lock disengaging. The door cracked open slightly. Come in. There was a faint scent of rock coming from within the room, which was as far removed from the place Zack had been as the heavens were from the earth. 
hoping that his nose could get used to the smell. Zack nimbly wriggled into the room. Once the door shut, he saw that the interior was tiny and dark. The door led directly to the kitchen and ding room, which was furnished with a table. There was a candle on the table, whose feeble light somewhat dispelled the darkness of the room. A filthy man who looked like he dealt in violence for a living pulled up a nearby chair and took a seat. The chair creaked as he sat on it, as though moaning in pain. The man was heavily muscled and had a barrel chest, and the exposed parts of his arms and his face were lightly scarred. The chair looked like it was going to give way under his weight. Oh, Zack. What's wrong? What happened? There's been a change in the situation. The prey is preparing to move. Ah, so we'll have to make our move as well. Zack nodded silently. The man quietly grumbled. Why now? Can't they think of this a little? As he reached up to scratch his messy hair. Can't you delay them somehow? That'll be difficult, because it was that woman's request. The man had already heard Zack talk about that woman several times, and he frowned deeply. That old man should use his brains a little and try to talk her down. The roads at night are nasty places to be, with scary bandits showing up and all. Give me a break. Even an idiot knows about that sort of thing. Eh? How about sabotaging a coach wheel and dragging out the departure until tomorrow? That won't work, he's already loading the luggage. It would be better to act quickly, right? M.M., that's true. The man stared into the air as he thought. Then, when are they moving out? In about two hours. That'll be cutting it really close. Or what should I do? I'll need to contact the others after this. With only two hours. It'll be hard, but they're prize catchers. The man twiddled his thumbs as he considered how much time the entire process would take. Zack simply listened to his musings in silence, looking down at his hands. Rich people like that piss you off, right? Zack thought of the delicate, dainty hands of the girl who was addressed as the young mistress. Nobody who worked on a farm would have hands as pretty as that. Their skin was split from icy water and thickened by swinging a hoe, and even their nails grew gnarled. A farmer's hands were like that. He knew well that the world was unfair. However, the corner of Zack's mouth twisted up in a lewd smile that bared his teeth. Can I have some fun with that woman? You'll have to wait for us to finish first, and since we're going to ransom her off, you can't go too far. Don't hurt her too badly. The man sneered in lasciviously. Perhaps it was because of his rising desire, but he suddenly got to his feet. All right, we'll do it. I'll contact the chief. Got it. We'll send about ten guys AEAD to the usual place to ambush them. You should move to and get them there in about four hours' time. If you haven't arrived by then, we'll make the first move. So keep the prey obedient and lower their guard.